All right. So um, this I'm Lewis Malmadrona, and this is the Howling Coyote Podcast. And I'm interviewing Justin Pack. And welcome to all of Wabanaki Confederacy. I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the unceded territory of the Penobscot Nation. And I want to honor their elders, past, present, and future. And also to acknowledge the entire Wabanaki Confederacy. So um, we're going, we're here with Justin Pack from California. And I came across Justin's work searching on indigenous philosophy and have uh, read a number of his papers and I'm really looking forward to hearing his ideas. I, I think he teaches at Cal State University Stanislaus. Did I get that right? That's right. Great. And please feel free to say anything more about yourself that you'd like to say. Um, well, uh, so yeah, I, I've been here for five years um, at Stan State. I study thoughtlessness. I'm particularly interested in the ways that um, smart people and smart institutions can uh, actually encourage certain forms of thoughtlessness. And originally then sort of the primary thinker that I got excited about was uh, German philosopher Hannah Arendt, who, um, yeah, he, she's sort of my, my major influence on, in terms of thinking about the problem of thoughtlessness. But um, as part of that, I've grown increasingly interested in, so Arendt wrote a book called The Human Condition. And in that book, she wanted to talk, she, well, she talks about a whole bunch of things, but she originally wanted to title the book Amor Mundi, which is Latin for love of the world. And uh, so a couple of years ago, I wrote a book called Amor Mundi, in which I bring together Native American philosophy, or specifically the philosophy of uh, DeLorean Wildcat, in conversation with Arendt to think about the thoughtlessness of our times and sort of combined her analysis of thoughtlessness with their analysis um, of world alienation in modern society. And so, and in terms of Native American philosophy, I'm not Native American. I appreciated your introduction there where you recognized, um, you know, where you're speaking from. I am speaking in Central Valley, California and what used to be Yokut land. Uh, and uh, I also think I'm hopeful, uh, since I am uh, not Native American, I'm hopeful that those that are listening We'll go consult Bindalore Jr. and Daniel Wildcat and read their things. Um, and so I, I don't want to, you know, I mean, I, I am me, I'm going to be talking, but um, I'm hoping that this will, people will, people who are interested will go read their stuff and see what they have to say about it, um, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and indeed. And regardless, we want to form alliances with people, with forward thinkers. So whatever we are, we need more friends <laughs> <You know? Yeah. clears throat> because, because the dominant paradigm um, is powerful. And I think we need to amass allies wherever we can find them to oppose the dominant paradigm and bring in these other paradigms that interest you and I, you and me, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so probably there's some people here in Maine who haven't heard of, of uh, Hannah Arendt. Can you say a little bit more about her philosophy and how it runs parallel to indigenous philosophy? So Arendt was a German Jewish woman who was a student of Martin Heidegger, very famous uh, German phenomenologist, very important figure in continental philosophy. Um, and she, um, had to flee Germany um, when the Nazis took power uh, and lived the rest of her life in the United States. And one of the questions that interested her and part of the reason that I'm interested in her is she, for the rest of her career, one of the things that she was concerned about and trying to answer was not just how could the Holocaust happen, but how could 
smart people, intelligent people, vote for Hitler and support Nazis. Um, I mean, she looked at people she knew personally and that she cared about. And, you know, we could put it this way. We could say, how could you, how could a country that at the time was the most scientifically advanced and one of the most artistically uh, recognized countries, how could they democratically elect Hitler? So she gets, she was, she wondered about this for a long time and wrote a whole bunch of different books uh, on various topics. But I, I think it's very clear that this, one of her fundamental concerns was how could this happen? And part of her answer is thoughtlessness, mm -hmm. by which she means not that someone isn't using their brains because people use their brains. And in fact, her most famous example of a sort of thoughtless individual was uh, a guy named Adolf Eichmann, who uh, was responsible for organizing, basically rounding up Jews and sending them to concentration camps during the Holocaust. So he was a very competent and smart person. He could do things that involved, you know, that you needed to have a logistical, you know, capacity. You needed to be able to figure things out. So he was clearly a smart guy. But after, so long story short, after the war, he fled to Argentina. He was captured by Jewish spies and taken back to uh, Israel and put on trial. And Arendt, since she was Jewish American, well, she was Jewish German and then now living in America, was asked by the magazine Atlantic Monthly to go there and to attend the trial. And the interesting thing she noticed was that Eichmann, when he was at, at the trial, he kept saying, don't blame me, blame the higher ups. And he would try to, he would make these excuses for himself, like, oh, I'm just caught in the machinery. I'm, I'm not a bad person, you know, blame Hitler, blame these people higher up. And so he absolutely refused to take responsibility. So what Arendt noticed is she didn't just think this was him. She noticed it in the United States. She noticed it in post-war Germany, that there were a lot of smart people who would sort of get caught up and, and were helping certain machineries run, but they weren't asking good questions about what they were doing. They weren't asking questions about whether what they were doing was ethical. Um, they were sort of, in, in Eichmann's case, he was very concerned about his career and advancing his career. And he even later claimed, he said, I don't hate Jews. I didn't want necessarily want to see Jews die. I just had to do my job. It was a very sort of weird argument to make. And so Arendt argues that what we're seeing here is a kind of thoughtlessness. It's not a thoughtlessness where you don't use your brain at all. It's actually what she says, a kind of thoughtlessness where you use your brain a certain way, but not another way. Her specific words for this are cognition. So her, her word cognition is what she uses for what you do when you try to solve a math problem or when you're trying to figure out you know, some sort of problem and you use your brain for problem solving. And so we talk about problem solving skills. She says, you can have a person who's really good at solving math and solving problem solving. They could be logical. They could be, used, so they're clearly using their brain, you know, doing advanced statistics or whatever, but they're not asking certain important questions like, is this moral or immoral? Or should I be doing this? So in a certain sense, they're playing a certain game that's set into place, but they're not questioning the game. They may be winning the rules, they may be winning, they may be succeeding, but they're not asking whether what they're doing, whether the whole system itself is moral or not. So Arendt is a good figure if you're trying to think about the ways that we get caught up in certain ways of doing things and maybe well-meaning, we may be trying our best and we might actually be trying to do good and yet we might be doing very bad things. And so of course, from, from a perspective of Vine Deloria and Daniel Wildcat, they don't talk about a rent, but, but I, I, in reading their stuff, I sensed you know, this, you know, this frustration with the inability of people, they're, they're both from the United States, the inability of people to recognize what Native Americans have gone through in the United States, what Native Americans are going through in the United States. But they don't just speak, inter, you know, when you understand something of what Deloria presents as Native American ontology, he would say, it's not just about Native Americans and Native American survival, it's about all the different peoples, meaning the animals and plants and ecosystems and environments that are considered brothers and sisters in Native American ontology. So they're seeking to defend um, you know, the plants, the animals, the environment, the ecosystems, entire communities of peoples, not just Native Americans. And they argue that we're seeing these sort of be torn apart, not necessarily by people that are terrible, evil, bad people, 
exactly what Arendt says, but, you know, but nonetheless, people who are sort of thoughtlessly participating in this. So I think it's a nice place to fit these two together and think about um, the damage that's being done by people who aren't necessarily bad and who aren't necessarily trying to kill Native Americans or destroy the environment, but who nonetheless are contributing to that piece by piece. Yes, and it, it reminds me of what you said in your master's thesis from Brigham Young, which was that in the modernist paradigm that there are innumerable functionaries who, who perform their duties as cogs in the machine, and I hope I'm paraphrasing you correctly, without ever thinking about what it is that the whole project is about. Is that a fair rendition of what you said? Yeah, that's certainly the sort of thing that Arendt is worried about. And then I think that we see a lot of Native American philosophers, you know, saying, wait a minute, you know, what are we doing here? Um, maybe we should think about the speed and the degree of, of, of you know, and how we're going about things. The, the other thing that really impressed me from your writing is this whole notion of, of the, the sort of, um, <clears throat> I don't know what the word is, maybe implementation or, the, or of the modernist paradigm, the, the sort of, um, I don't know, the way that it, it, it ravages communities and, and it's challenging its philosophical assumptions, I think. And, and I'll preface that by saying that, that I work in medicine and, and um, it's extremely modernist. And, and I'm, I've, I'm reached a point of incredible frustration with this paradigm, which doesn't appear to make people any healthier. You know, um, the statistic that I read is that if you make it to age five, you have the same lifespan today as you did in 1905. So apparently we've done a good job in helping children to make it from birth to age five, which probably has a lot to do with plumbing and, and perhaps vaccines. <clears throat> but, but for all our technology and our modernist assumptions, we haven't done very much in terms of results. And, and I wondered, I thought it would be fabulous if you could talk a little bit about the assumptions of the modernist paradigm and, and um, their, their um, lack of proof or lack of validity potentially. Um, well, there's various places I could enter this question from various perspectives. Um, but perhaps since we're sort of focusing on indigenous thought, I'll enter into it, try to enter it from the Deloria Wildcat perspective. And uh, they're very clear in this book, Power in Place, uh, which is a book that for me was really important and very eye-opening. It's a book that they wrote for Native Americans. So it's a book written by Native Americans for Native Americans. And their basic argument, their worry is, is that many Native American students are, are to succeed in life, are supposed to get a, a STEM, you know, it's a STEM training is useful just in terms of getting a career. So a lot of students are sort of funneled into science, technology, engineering, math. Uh, but DeLorean and Wildcat worry about this because from their perspective, modern science directly contradicts uh, what they call Native American ontology. And the basic difference here, according to DeLorean Wildcat, is that on the Native American model, um, plants, animals, you know, whole environmental systems, but even things like rocks and landscapes are alive. And as such, Deloria says, we need to treat them um, like they're, we need to treat them as if they were humans, or he says we need to develop a relationship with them that is a relationship in which there's a back and forth and a discussion. And they go through different ways in which having that back and forth looks like. But what they worry about is that the modern attitude or the modern scientific attitude, modern and scientific aren't necessarily the same thing, but it, speaking broadly, 
their worry is that the sort of scientific attitude sees the physical world as dead, but not just dead, as lacking. And lacking, in other words, it could be better. And humans have a sort of calling to fix it, to make the world a better place. And that's why technology is such an important thing in modern thought, because uh, technology is kind of uh, the savior of humans in the sense that our, our, all our science and our technology works together to make the human condition better. But um, according to DeLorean Wildcat, the, their, their concern about this is, you know, first of all, that you start from a place where you think of everything as being dead. And not surprisingly, you, end up, you still end up with the view that everything is dead. But you also view the world as a place that is for humans to use and for humans to fix. And so there's a, almost a sort of predatory attitude where we look around and we say, what can I, you know, how can I use this to help me out? But it's not a, a relationship um, of two equal beings or of two beings that are actually having a back and forth. There's, a, there's instead just sort of, an, uh, again, like a predatory attitude of these things around me uh, are useful for me. How can I use them? And so um, Wildcat at one point quotes um, uh, a, an individual called Big Soldier. And Big Soldier has, is right, this is in, I think, 1820. And Big Soldier is responding to some white settlers who are coming in. And who are trying to encourage Big Soldier and, and uh, other groups in the in the plains to join, basically basically live a life like uh, the Western lifestyle. Big Soldier says, he says, I see that you have a lot of conveniences, and that there's a lot of things that look good about your life, but everything around you is in chains, and including yourself, you are in chains. And he means by that partially. Um, that everything is being treated. Actually, he, he doesn't just say you're in chains. He says you've turned everything into slaves. And so he doesn't, he's not just referring to modern, you know, to slavery in the United States. He specifically says like all the objects around you have been turned into slaves. So there's a worry amongst them. Arendt shares this worry. There's quite a few, um, um, you know, there's, there's people within the Western tradition also who worry about this attitude towards the natural world and towards, of course, once you're treating the world as a place to be used for whatever you want, it's not hard to start treating humans that way too. And so the Holocaust on Arendt's, um, in Arendt's thought is a kind of culmination of an attitude that says, let's turn the world into a better place, eliminate anything that we don't like that doesn't fit, right? And, and take whatever's left and turn it into whatever we want. So there's a worry about, I mean, we often in modern society praise technological power but Vine DeLore and Daniel Wildcat worry that uh, Western technology is deeply unhealthy and that it alienates us from the world. Once you see the world as an object to be sort of, uh, you know, used, manipulated, consumed, changed, you're <coughs> separate from it and it creates this distance and you, you lose a whole bunch of relationships, you lose, connect, you lose connection to the natural world, you lose, uh, you know, there's, so there's a kind of world alienation going on here. And uh, I wrote a book called Amor Mundi, which is about this ways that we are alienated from the very world around us. And that's the criticism that Wildcat and, and, and Deloria really harp on really strongly is that like, and they, and they worry, they look at young Native Americans and they say these Native Americans are being taught in uh, Western schools and these Native American, the, the, young, the young men and women then will go back um, and be with other Native Americans and they'll see their grandfather talking to coyotes and they, for them, it's like, they don't understand like, well, that's weird. How is that possible? You can't talk to coyotes, explain us to this. But Deloria says, um, well, if you've been, you know, sort of sucked into an ontology that says coyotes are just, just animals and that they're basically, you know, they're, you know, they're not necessarily intelligent. They can't talk back to you. You know, they're just like a dog. What, once you have this attitude that doesn't see them as a, uh, a being full of life and full of spirit. I mean, there's a spiritual side to it, right? Once you reject the spiritual side of it and all you get is this sort of mechanical world, then yeah, it becomes hard to believe that someone can talk to a coyote. It becomes hard to believe that someone can have a sort of relationship. And, and it's been interesting for me as someone who's 
not Native American to read this stuff. And uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm not gonna pretend that I can simply grab Native American customs and take them over. I certainly don't wanna do that. But I have, it has changed the way I see the world and it has changed the way that I try to relate to the world. Um, and so you know, when I see um, and, and, and interact with the natural world, I always have Deloria's voice in the back of my head now telling me, um, you know, you need to treat this being with respect. And whatever else we make of Native American thought, for, that for me has been something deeply important on a philosophical and spiritual level is learning to regain a sense of the, um, the, a certain reality to uh, the world uh, and uh, an otherness to it that needs to be respected and, uh, and approached and spoken to and dealt with on those terms, not on my terms. Indeed. I, I just sort of went off there talking about a bunch of stuff. I don't know if I, uh, I forgot what your initial question was. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's good. And, and I think, I think my, one of my projects is, is to establish indigenous philosophy as equal to Euros, Eurocentric philosophy. And I think to do that, we need um, colleagues who are not Native American who are saying, hey, this is good stuff. We like this stuff. You know, let's explore this further. I think it was Russell Means who said the big mistake Ames med made was not to cultivate friends. And and I think I think it's it's more than it's about survival. And at this point, I don't think the human race is going to survive because I think the capitalist paradigm will win. But I'd like to be wrong. <laughs> I hope for the benefit of my children and grandchildren, I hope I'm wrong. And I think you know, that we need these notions that we're talking about that exist in indigenous philosophies and exist in Hannah Arendt and, and others. Um, we need them to, to grow and multiply in order to change us. There's an interesting paper in the, in the African Journal of Primary Care, which is probably not one of the most widely read journals in the world, but it's by a, a, a woman in, I think it's in Zimbabwe, who says that the way you change medical students is by teaching them philosophy. If, if they can change their philosophy, they'll change the way they interact with people. And I was, I was really impressed with that. And I was also, you know, I, I thought about, I read, I've read in some of your papers about, I mean, this, this whole notion of um, technology. And I, I was thinking today, um, I'm not convinced that technology has given us a better life. It's given us a different life. Um, I don't know that people are any happier now than before technology. And I suspect they might have been more happy before technology. And, and a quick story, and then I'll ask you another question. Um, I had the privilege and, and pleasure of being a visiting faculty in Alice Springs, Australia, at their Center for Rural and Remote Health. And one of the amazing stories I heard was about a remote community in which uh, there was no electricity. And every night people would gather around fires to tell stories and, and to be with each other. And um, suddenly electricity appeared. And there was no more need to gather around fires and tell stories. And the community fell apart. The addictions exponentially increased, violence exponentially increased. And in fact, technology had destroyed their happiness, their um, sense of connectedness with each other. Just the bringing of electricity had, had wrecked havoc with their way of life. 
and it was it was a very sobering tale to hear i think so so maybe maybe where we could go what what one of the things that really interests me is is when you name the assumptions of modernism you know and then um well compare those assumptions with those of indigenous philosophies which we do, i think that was one one of your papers i forget the title but but it hopefully i'm remembering correctly yeah um yeah, so let's see if we compare the assumptions that we make. I mean, there's, there's a lot of them, so it depends. Um, you know, we could go through different um, regions of, you know, so there's ontology, there's epistemology, um, aesthetics. So there's in philosophy traditionally sort of broken itself up into these subcategories that study different things. You know, the ontology is what is reality, and epistemology is how do we know things. And part of what for me is really fascinating about DeLorean Wildcat's perspective is they stress, they emphasize that Native American thought, and I know there are Native American philosophies and different, many different Native American traditions. Deloria purposefully talks about Native American thought as if it's all the same, which I'm sure some people will be like, oh, that's not a good idea. But he does so on purpose because he wants to contrast it with Western thought. So he knows that there are different Western philosophies and that there are different Native American philosophies. But in terms of the plight of the human condition, as you talked about earlier, he says, I know that there are, that's more complicated than this, but I'm going to simplify and say Western thought versus Native American thought. So I'll follow him here in that regard. And so one of the things he points out is that in Native American thought, there's a huge emphasis on place um, in, a, in a place in a sense that doesn't exist in Western thought. So Western thought is all about, it emphasizes epistemology. How do we know? Now, and I'm, I'm referring to modern thought. Um, so modern thought, and so it is, science is a part of this, but it's broader than science. Um, it's, there's figures like Descartes and Hobbes that were writing in the um, you know, 1600s, and you could go back to the 1500s and, and track certain figures. Um, but really in the 1600s, we get this strong idea that the best way to study reality is to study it um, in a sort of way that takes it apart and looks at it in pieces. So it's, um, I mean, there's a, another philosopher, Nietzsche says that there's a, there's a dissective method to it. We take things apart, we cut it up into little pieces, we find out what the pieces are and then we put it back together. It's like a Lego, Lego vision of the universe. As if the whole world, as if everything was made of Legos and I, you know, or I had, a, I had a brother that when we were younger, he wanted to know how computers work. So he took his, he bought an old computer and he took it apart, uh, took it apart and he found all the pieces inside and he figured out what they did and he put it back together. And so the basic idea that, and, and that's very much the way a lot of Western science and a lot of, um, you know, people like Descartes said we should proceed. He said, let's systematically do experiments, take things apart, figure out how the pieces work together and then um, you know, we'll understand how things work. And that tends to treat things in a very abstract manner. So we don't ask necessarily, um, you know, so if I'm trying to understand a particular lizard and I want to know, well, what is this lizard like? Uh, you can cut it to pieces and you can look at its bones and you can understand those parts of it. And you can sort of try to figure it out by taking it apart. Um, but Deloria and Wildcat argue that uh, Native American thought is first and foremost tied to place. And so, and this idea is a little bit hard, um, I think, for Western people that are, have a very Western way of thinking to understand, because we, we don't, again, we tend to think in fairly abstract terms, <coughs> excuse me, not in terms of place. So, so for example, um, I currently live in uh, Central Valley, California. It's this huge valley in the middle of it. Um, it's fairly dry. It's been changed a lot from the way things used to be. But if you go to the east of us, there are these very tall mountains. And you basically go from like zero feet, we're at like 70 feet above sea level where I'm at. And you can go up to the tallest mountain in the, in the continental United States, um, Mount Whitney. So you can go up 14,000 feet from where I am. And it's 
not that, you know, it's just, you're just sort of going up the mountain as you go. But everything on top of those mountains is different from things about halfway down the mountains, and that's different from things at the bottom. So for Deloria, he would say, if your goal is to understand the different people and things in a particular environment, well, that knowledge is going to change radically depending on where you are. Uh, so, I mean, it sounds sort of obvious when you say it, but a mountain lion living here where I am versus a mountain lion that's living 7,000 feet further up the mountain versus a mountain lion. I mean, I don't think they go to 14,000 feet very much, but these different animals are gonna act differently in different places. And there are different animals and different plants in different places. And so to understand them, you need to understand all them all in tandem. So you need to, you know, so if you're gonna, if you're gonna try to grow crops, you need to understand the growing season and the rainy season and, you know, the wind and the soil patterns. There's actually a lot of knowledge that goes into having a competent sense of these sorts of things. And what you need to know where I live is different from what you need to know where you live. And it's gonna be different from someone who lives in certain parts of Texas. And so all these different places have different kinds of knowledge. And the Native American model says, it's not simply a matter of taking knowledge in one place and it doesn't automatically import to another place. That's what abstract knowledge does. Is you think that well, once I know how a certain lizard is, well, I'm gonna know how it is in a different place too. But it's not, these are not abstract beings. Furthermore, you, to understand and relate to a place, you must do so ethically. So instead of treating them as objects to be studied and figured out and controlled, you treat them the way you treat, um, hopefully, the way we treat other people. Um, so respectfully and, and working with them over time and in a place. So the, again, there are certain animals and plants that grow where I live. And they're going to act differently than animals and plants that live you know, where you're at. And if you're going to try to grow corn or grow whatever, you need to be very aware of these differences and sensitive to them. And you need to have a certain, they would say, so here's, here's the probably the most extreme version of how radical this is. The idea would be that ethics itself depends on place. And Deloria and Wildcat are very clear about this. And again, from their perspective, once you sort of understand the basic paradigm, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, different places are made of different kinds of people. They interact with each other differently. And therefore, to really function in that place, you're going to need to have uh, a competent relationship and understanding of all those people. So there's this huge ethical, uh, there's a huge difference in how we need to act ethically in different places. If you compare this with the two main theories of modern ethics, uh, utilitarianism and Kantianism, which are the two most famous sort of ones that have dueled for the last 300 years in philosophy. And everyone's sort of like, well, are you a utilitarian or are you a Kantian deontologist? But both of those approaches are very abstract. They're trying to develop an ethics that would be universal and true for all people in all times, no matter where you are. So utilitarian philosophy is supposed to be the same in California than it is in Maine, than it is in Florida, than it is in Texas. But DeLorean and Wildcat say what they would talk about as ethics, as in um, you know, having morally appropriate and responsible relationships with people in a particular place, because there are different peoples, plants, animals, soils, rivers, in different places, the ethics themselves are going to be different. So there's this really interesting um, and I think powerful understanding of ethics and relationships that is directly tied to place, at least on the presentation that Deloria makes, that's completely different with how Western thought approaches ethics and knowledge uh, and you know, just our general relationship with the world. Uh, you know, again, the Western thought says, how do I understand this abstractly? What are the general principles I can use? You can really, you can really see this when you get into specific ethical theories. I mean, utilitarianism is just sort of like, let's weigh out the pros and cons and maximize the good and minimize the bad. And it's this sort of very economic, you know, it's like an economic approach to ethics. And sometimes I think it, it has some interesting good answers, but for, for utilitarianism, it doesn't matter where you are, the theory is the same anywhere. And so there's a clearly here a very radical, fascinating and challenging difference in how Native American ethics and ontology and epistemology work. So DeLorean Wildcat, they say there is, there are Native American technologies. 
but Native American technologies are tied to place. There are Native American ethics. Those are tied to place. And they basically say, everything you want to funnel through here, you need to tie it to place. And then they're going to turn around and say, so not surprisingly, what do you see in Western thought? A disconnection from place and a disconnection from uh, the communities. And here again, I refer to non-human communities, but also, as you were just saying, human communities. So, and, and it, it gets even crazier when we're on the internet, because the internet, you can sort of dwell in these like odd non-places or, you know, they're not a physical place, but you have these bizarre communities. It's not necessarily bad. I'm not trying to say it's bad, but it's very disconnected from the world that we're in, uh, in ways that I do think leads to some profound um, and important forms of disconnection and alienation. So, you know, Gloria and Wildcat are saying, reconnect with place, reconnect with the communities in that place, both human and non-human, um, develop an ethics that's relative to that, to that place. And to your point earlier, they would argue that that is an important part of happiness and having a sense of belonging and having a sense of community is that all these things are tied together to a particular place and the peoples that are in that place. When you cut all those off, uh, I mean, so Arendt, she, her, again, I mentioned that she wanted to title her book a more Mundi, Love of the World, partially because she felt like in modern society, we, and this is gonna sound weird at first, we consume our worlds. Mm. We, you know, so not just that we eat everything, but that we turn everything into a commodity and we buy and sell everything. And so it's like, we're selling, she says, basically we're selling the world out from under our own feet. And we're left with standing, you know, there's nowhere to stand. And so we end up alone uh, in a sort of empty, empty place without any connection. So again, you see this similar concern with um, the ways that traditional communities had connections with each other and with the literally, you know, the plants and animals and world itself. Uh, Arendt is also concerned with our connection with buildings and our connection with, uh, you know, like, you know, it's like if you build up, you know, like say Rome or some you know, you big beautiful city and people feel like they need to, there's a sort of love of Rome or a love of certain, you know, like groups and say, you know, I'm proud to be Cherokee, I'm proud to be Apache, I'm proud to be whatever. Um, and, and, you know, but, but there's a worry that we've lost a lot of that in modern life. And we have these sort of fake versions where we're like, I'm proud to be an American or I'm proud to be whatever, but they're, they're not really connected very often in place. And they're uh, often sort of superficial, you know, just wave your flag and move on. And so there, and this, this is a complaint that's not just in philosophers. You hear sociologists talking about this, you hear psychologists talking about, so there's, there's a lot of recognition that, yeah, there's a kind of fragmentation that seems to have happened as a result of modern thought and modern science. And that fragmentation affects us as individuals in terms of our happiness, in terms of our connection with the world. So yeah, DeLorean Wildcat would say, um, yeah, we, we need to reconnect with our, with place. You know, I, I see that here in Maine in the sense that um, despite the terrible trauma that indigenous people have experienced here, there is a sense of connectedness and belongingness <clears throat> that their European derived um, neighbors don't feel. And you know, I, I work in the I work within the five tribes. Um, previously, I worked both within the five tribes and outside of the five tribes, but um, now it's mostly just with the five tribes because I value that connectedness. And so uh, my wife, who's, the, who's a psychotherapist with the, one of the, um, with the urban center um, here in Bangor for native people in Maine, is putting, she's putting together with um, her supervisor, um, a program on indigenous ethics for social workers. And so one, one of the social workers came up with a, with a program, with a, a talk about intergenerational trauma. And, and um, so my wife's boss 
said, okay, good. But now we have to talk about resilience. And that really struck me because I thought, so what makes it so much more meaningful for me to work in these indigenous communities, which are full of problems, than to work in non-indigenous communities? And it has to do with this sense of belongingness, that people are still connected to, the, to this place, to the land on which their ancestors lived and died. And, and there's a, a, a duty to each other that doesn't exist outside of the indigenous communities. I mean, you don't find that in non-indigenous people in Bangor, Maine. Um, they don't really care about each other. And I, and I thought, well, that's, that's part of the resilience is this sense of connection to place and to each other as people from this place, embedded in this place belonging to this place, you know, and of this place. And, you know, it, it, it struck me that maybe that's why indigenous people are, are still here in North America, because it sure was, I mean, it sure was a, a big genocide. I mean, even before the Holocaust. We sort of have the American Holocaust that preceded the German Holocaust. Maybe they learned from, from the United States how to do it, you know, and, and ramped it up a notch with technology. Um, so let me see if I can turn that into a question to stimulate more conversation. Um, Maybe, maybe I could ask you if you could say a, a bit more about um, epistemology. And I'll, I'll frame that in the sense that, that I'm trying to understand how to overthrow the tyranny of the double-blinded randomized control trial, which I think is blatantly absurd because from my standpoint, nothing is random and there's no control. And it's all full of chaos and intention matters and nobody's blind. And, um, and yet the dominant paradigm worships this particular methodology. And so maybe I could, with that having been said, maybe I could invite you to say a few words about epistemology. All right. So here, so I, I did a, uh, my PhD is in philosophy. I did do a master's degree in sociology. And you mentioned earlier that you read some of that, you read the thesis that I wrote there. And so what, part of what really is fascinating about one of the problems with attempt, so here's what interests me and I, with regards to what you're talking about. And that's related to this question of place and people. Um, again, modern scientific epistemology um, when it treats the world as just objects. So even now, well, of course, okay, if you look at the history of, especially if we look at the history of medicine over the last um, 150 years in the United States, um, or you can include Europe, there's been a lot of situations where um, doctors and scientists treated human beings as if they were just objects to be studied. Uh, you know, the most famous example, of course, it brings us back to the Nazis with uh, Dr. Mengele, um, who was performing these terrible, um, you know, horror story experiments, sewing people together and, um, you know, removing things from, you know, he, he loved twins and he would do these, he liked twins because he could have a control and he could do something to one twin and not do it to the other. And he could say, you know, here we, so but there's, there's more examples than just that. And in the United States has a, a track record of these sort of experiments that have been done. And it took a while for people to sort of wake up and say, we need to have stronger ethical standards. So one of the classes I teach is bioethics. And we begin the class by talking about this history and the history of eugenics. 
but specifically about the ways that the problem with eugenics and the problem with a lot, a lot of these, um, with just applying science straightforwardly to humans is that human beings are not just objects, but they are also subjects. And people in the social sciences know this because um, you know, you, if you do an experiment on the rock, it doesn't talk back. Yeah, it does. Well, from a Native American's perspective, it does. But from a sociologist's perspective, they would say, the rock will just sort of, you do whatever you do to it, it can't resist. Again, yeah, from a Native American perspective, it does. But I'm thinking just in the whole, this is like the debate that happened among Western thinkers trying to deal with this. So they said, you know, but, but humans do talk back. And now we know, of course, placebo effects. So when you, when you do things to humans, it affects how they respond to things. And so you can't just treat them as an object both in terms of trying to get the best experiment possible, but also in terms of just acting ethically with, within medicine and within these other things. So there's a question of whether the scientific method, uh, how much can we apply that to um, living to subjects, probably the best way to put it. Um, and this is a widely debated, widely known, widely discussed um, topic, especially in the social sciences, you see it, um, because there's this question of like, can we be scientific? Are we getting objective knowledge? How true is the knowledge that we're getting when we're dealing with human beings who are, you know, not like rocks? Of course, what to me then, if we bring the indigenous perspective back in, then you get an interesting problem of, well, you know, no, like you said earlier, the rocks themselves are not just objects. The animals are not just objects. And so from a Native American's perspective, it's even crazier because you're not just, uh, you're not just in danger of treating human beings as objects. You're in danger, like I said earlier with that quote from Big Soldier, of treating the whole world as objects. So there's a completely different way of understanding how I can and should understand things. Um, in the hard sciences, in the social sciences, which I would argue shouldn't even consider themselves sciences because of this problem. Um, uh, so I always, it always, I always found it disconcerting when people would talk about the social sciences and I was like, oh, you know, I, I don't know, I think we're more like the humanities than uh, hard sciences. But yeah, once you, but there's a, so there's a level of analysis and of what is allowed into the conversation that varies depending on your approach. And if you're gonna take a sort of hard science approach, then the level of analysis is gonna be uh, generally abstract, quantitative, and you don't really have to worry about ethical questions um, unless it comes back and hits people a certain way. But in the social sciences, you're by nature have this interesting problem of, well, I can't just use straightforward traditional scientific methods because I'm not dealing with uh, objects, I'm dealing with subjects, and there are ethical implications of that. And then DeLorean Wildcat would say, yeah, from the Native American perspective, that is even a more drastic thing because you need to uh, relate to the natural world. And, you know, it, it's not the sort of thing that if you, once you reduce it to objects, you've already passed the line of something unethical. And it's interesting, uh, you know, there's a, a woman named Robin Wall Kimmerer who is, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with her yes, stuff. Yes, indeed. And yes, she talks about this in these really nice ways where she says, I'm trained as a scientist, but I'm also, uh, you know, have this Native American background. And she says she's got these two paradigms sort of fighting in her own head. And she can put on her science hat and do things scientifically. And then she can put on her Native American hat or maybe take off her science hat and go back to having her sort of Native American perspective. And she talks about this fascinating tension between how things are treated from a, you know, I don't know if we call it purely scientific perspective versus how she approaches things from her sort of personal, um, you know, cultural Native American perspective. I, I thought her writing was really eye-opening and wonderful as she's dealing with these tensions and talking about how, yeah, these are two very different things, uh, you know, radically, you know, they're, they're not totally incommensurate, but um, and so you can, you can learn about the other one and, and understand. So I don't want to claim that they're incommensurate, but the ethical, ramifications of them are quite stark. Mm -hmm. Indeed. There, there's another woman that's, who's really fascinating. 
uh, Kovac, I don't know if you know her work. She wrote a book, in Indi Indigenizing Methodologies. Oh, I have seen that. I don't, it's been a while since I looked at that. Yeah, yeah. And, and she's maybe a little less poetic than Brady Sweetgrass, <laughs> but still very, very personal, very like re self-revealing. And I think that's actually a methodological perspective is that is the self-revealing, you know, the, the, the refutation of the objectivity stance and the embracement of the sort of calm subjectivity stance that, you know, we're in this together and, and I'm not standing outside looking at you, I'm inside with you and we're together. And I think that's, that's the beauty of braiding sweetgrass is, is that she does that. I mean, when she talks from her Native American hat, you know, she, she is there with the plants and nature and not outside of them. And, and I think, I think my big challenge is figuring out how to do research, how to move my research into that intersubjectivity place and still get it through the IRB. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's these institutional constraints that say what counts as legitimate and illegitimate. I think there's also these interesting pressures because, you know, when people are trying to get tenure and trying to survive in academia, um, certain methods are easier or if not easier, they're quicker. And so like I noticed when I was in sociology that sometimes people would do, they wanna do statistical analysis and run a regression model more than anything, just because it was faster. And to sort of have to spend your time reflecting on, you know, you and what makes you, and there's these, all these relationships and these ethical questions, that's hard and it can take a lot of work in ways that I think it's easier just to say like, you know, I want to get this done. Let me crunch the numbers, get my, you know, R squared is blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, and, and then journals will look at this and they'll say, look, well, here's, you know, this, you know, this just does an impressive statistical analysis and they'll accept this sort of thing. And if you're doing something from an indigenous perspective or from a non-traditional sort of method, then you have a problem of the most prestigious journals very likely won't accept you and you have to publish in places that are going to be seen less. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's, there's like these institutional feedback loops that discourage non-traditional methods and the places that pop up and that are encouraging non-traditional methods, um, you know, get a lot of, you know, they can get, they can come under some heavy fire. Um, you know, and I think they have a real struggle to create spaces that aren't just functioning according to the same old logic that things tend to function by. Indeed, indeed. And I, I recently have, I'm, I've created a, a new, for me, life story interview. And I wanted to, to um, do it with a few people and see if we could come up with some agreement on how to code it. And I thought, well, I'd like to just do it with my friends and, you know, that would be fun. And the IRB just freaked out. <laughs> They said, you can't, what, they said, it's completely a bizarre and weird to talk to your friends about their lives. <laughs> that seems normal to me to talk to my friends about their lives. It seems more weird to talk to strangers about my life. But of course, you know, I, I complied with them and got rid of the, um, talking to my friends about their lives plan. But, but I thought, you know, maybe, you know, here's the kind of indigenous versus Eurocentric difference in ethical thinking, you know? Like, I'd rather talk to people I know about my lives and they'd rather talk to people they don't know about their lives. So it struck me as odd. 
Yeah, that desire for objectivity has some strange effects. That, and the thing is, when, once you're doing it, what, you know, when you're caught up in that system, it seems sort of natural and like this, of course, this is what we're going to be scientific, but when you're coming from an outside perspective, right? And you're like, well, I can't talk to my friends or, you know, I have to take this detached perspective. And then, you know, and then, and then the idea that that is objective. Feminist, you know, feminist thought's been really good on this. There's a lot of good feminist philosophers who've criticized they'll look at the history of philosophy or the history of science and they'll look at the ways that scientists that were supposedly being objective nonetheless imported masculine ideas or masculine metaphors or at least certain cultural metaphors and because they were insensitive to the ways that their own ideas were shaped by gender and culture uh, they were proposing they were saying that these certain things we've discovered are objective dot, 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 when, and when, when they say objective, they mean there's nothing for you to say against it because it's the truth. And so some of these feminist, you know, philosophers of science came along and said, all you have to do is look at the history of last, you know, some of the advice that scientists or doctors have been giving women. And you'll notice that there's a lot of weird stuff in there, you know, historically, maybe we should be a little bit more suspicious of some of the things that get passed off as objective. And maybe to do that, we actually need to bring in culture and self-referentiality and you know these sort of awarenesses. So there's these interesting groups that are trying to push back about these claims that, you know, oh, it's everything's objective. This is you hear people say all the time, that's just what the numbers say. Mm. You know, I'm just looking at the data. And anytime I hear that for me personally, my, my alarms go off. Like, wait a minute, no, I don't know if there is simply just data or that this is objective and that no, you know what I mean? So you, you hear people doing this in, in politics, they want to pass something off and they'll say, oh. You know, the, here's a study that says blah, blah, blah. I'm just being objective, or this is just what reason says. And every time I hear that, I'm like, man, you know, you got to be aware of the history of people telling other people that this is what is reasonable, you know, and that this is what is objective. It's a pretty iffy history. That's not to say we have to entirely give up on objectivity, but we need a more complex understanding that looks at, like you're saying, that pays attention to all these other factors that we think we can get rid of via statistical analysis or via having a big enough, you know, sample size. Um, but I don't know that there's still many ways that these biases and problems can creep in, um, you know, if we're not sensitive to all these sorts of things. Yeah, and I, I remember from writing you talked about the, the project of modernism is control and that the enemy of modernism is ambiguity and, and I think, and, may, and maybe we could, maybe you could speak to this. It seems like Native American philosophy embraces ambiguity and, and I think recognizes the impossibility of control. Yeah, I like this. This is also, this is sort of, this gets me excited too. Well, it's interesting in terms of like, if we stick to, if we look at logic, for example, Western logic, and I mean like formal logic, logic that they started sort of, you know, that philosophers were doing on a piece of paper and they're doing logic. The one of the key fundamental parts of that is the principle of non-contradiction. The idea that something can't be one thing and also not be like, A is A, A can't be not A, right? So you, you can't have something that's a cat and not a cat. So there's this sort of trying to divide the world into like clear pieces. That you see, the author that you, that you were mentioning earlier, or that you know, that I wrote about was his name is Zygmunt Bauman. So he's this Polish sociologist, and he he says, look, in modernity, we're really obsessed. We think of the world. We want to make like a nice garden, and have everything separated. We got the peas in this row. We got the corn in this row. We got the beans in that row, and and they shouldn't be mixed up. And so we want things to sort of fit in nice little boxes, because once you've got it, you know, in, in sociological analysis you'll have certain variables, you know, you'll, you know, gender, male, female, you know, uh, white, black. But of course, once you look into race or gender, you know, you realize that it turns out it's way more messy than that, right? And so you can have people that are mixed race. And even if you look at any particular race, of course, race is a sort of weird made up category that we have. You know, it's not like they're, you know, like what is a white person? What is, you know, so these categories themselves are not, don't have discrete clear lines, right? So many white people 150 years ago thought Italians 
and Irish people didn't count as white, right? But now they count as white. Well, you know, who said, you know, the people, what, who gets to jump that box at what point? And so, yeah, there's this interesting problem where um, a lot, of, according to Bauman and according to a lot of critics of modern thought and modern philosophy, one of the problems they have is this desire to divide the world up into these little boxes where everything fits and things don't fit into two boxes because if they do fit into two boxes, you know, that would be this terrible contradiction and the whole thing, the whole logical system seems to fall apart. Um, you know, but there's various traditions, including some Native American traditions that would see someone that we would now think of as uh, gay and they would say, no, that's a person, there's these sort of non-male female categories. Uh, and so, you know, again, so, you know, queer philosophy and um, all these, some feminist philosophy, some of these approaches have said, what if we start off, what if we reject the idea that everything can be made into sort of cute categories and try thinking the world, you know, the world is a much more mixed up place than that. Uh, and and I, I do think that I, there's a lot of non-Western traditions that that seems really obvious to them. Like, well, of course things are ambiguous. No, you know, one thing doesn't fit into this box and not that box. Um, but much of our modern knowledge is sort of based on things fitting certain boxes and wanting to clearly delineate, delineate certain variables. You know, this is X, that's Y. Uh, and the question then is, well, if we reject that and say that everything's more ambiguous, what happens is that, you know, does the whole, is it all house of cards or, you know, how do, how do we deal with those ambiguities? Um, you know, and I, I do think that there are times when we see sort of modern academic systems really struggling to deal with ambiguity and, you know, recognizing that there's certain complexity. Native American perspective would say, you know, again, look at place. Maybe this particular animal that has certain behaviors in California is acting differently in, in Maine. And, you know, that sort of thing that might feel, you know, frustrating if you're trying to say, you know, this is what, this is what mountain lions do, or this is what raccoons do, or whatever sort of thing we're trying to look at. And then we discover that these quite different behaviors, um, you know, when you, if you don't think the world has to fit in the nice boxes, you're going to approach it differently. And, and you're going to approach it more open-endedly, I think, actually. You're going to have to be more open-minded because I don't know everything about raccoons. I don't know everything about mountain lions. This particular, you know, kind, you know, maybe it's a subspecies, whatever. I have to sort of think of it in the particular place and approach it in that place. So I, I do think there's a certain openness that you see in a lot of non-Western traditions that, um, and again, not there are parts of Western philosophy, of Western tradition that, are more responsive. I think there's a, historically there's been a lot of times where there seems to be this kind of obsession with fitting things into cute boxes and you're Jewish or you're not, right? And if you're Jewish, we're gonna kill you. And if you're not Jewish, you're okay. And you know, so people have done terrible things in the names of keeping their boxes separate, you know, and keeping different groups apart. And, you know, we have good reason to be alarmed about this and, and vigilant about it. Mm -hmm. At least, you know, we should be better about it. I mean, you see it happening in politics right now, you know, people are, you know, really want to, they want to build a wall, you know, and this is one country and that's another country. I was just uh, watching a video about some of the Native American groups that live in, well, uh, uh, there's various, but uh, there's one in Arizona and their traditional um, area goes over the border. So they've been, their community has been cut in half uh, and they've got this interesting problem. The interview was talking, it was some people that live on the Mexican side and they were talking about how uh, there's these now these tensions that exist in the community and they can't travel back and forth without you know it, legally they're supposed to be allowed to travel back and forth but just within the last four or five years uh, the border patrol's gotten really picky and it's like no you can only pass through at this particular place anyway so uh, all this just to say that i think that you know in in certain times we want you know you see even now there's these strong battles to say you know you're a man or you're a woman you know you can't go in this bathroom or you're American or you're Mexican. You can't go back and forth, pick, pick a side. And, and that's dangerous in a lot of ways. Indeed. I, I think it's, I don't know if you know Rebecca Sinclair. She's um, doing indigenous logic. Uh -huh. I hope to have her on the podcast. She's at Oregon State University. And she talks a lot about these ideas. So um, just to wrap up, um, 
tell us about the next paper that you haven't written yet. <laughs> um, I'm actually currently working on my, my pandemic project that I got started on is, uh, it's gonna be, assuming I can get this all worked out, it's gonna be entitled Money and Thoughtlessness. Uh -huh. um, and I'm just interested in the ways that, so my, my basic claim is that money leads to thoughtlessness. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to, um, but that money, and again, there have been different kinds of money historically. So this is what I look at. So it, it's a genealogy of money in which I, I should be more specific. I'm interested in how attitudes about money have changed over time. Um, because money in much of the ancient world, um, at least what we think of as money, like coins or um, dollar bills, things that you would trade like this, there's been a lot of suspicion of it historically and a lot of um, suspicion of merchants, especially. And so what I'm interested in is why, despite the fact that for thousands of years, worries about monies and, mer and merchants was one of the sort of big concerns of a lot of, uh, not just Western thought, but you see it in Chinese thought. Um, it's present in you know, multiple different traditions. There's this worry with merchants and with money. Um, you have it in, uh, anyway, so it, it varies depending on group, but there have been for a long, thousands of years, there have been people who have been worried about money and worried about merchants. And, but now you don't see that same degree of concern. Um, we do sort of talk about it popularly, like, well, but we, we treat it as if it's just something that has to be dealt with. So we sort of recognize that there are ethical, potentially ethical problems with money and merchants, but we've now sort of embraced it yeah. and said, this is the way we're gonna, you know, this, this is the most efficient way and it's a very productive way of doing things. So we've kind of completely flipped the traditional attitude um, about money. And so what I'm, anyway, I'm, I'm writing a book called Money and Thoughtlessness in which I'm arguing one, that our current situation where we've sort of forgotten these ethical concerns with money is itself kind of thoughtless, but also that a system driven by money and specifically abstract money, um, you think of universities this way, where you get these universities that have all this money behind them and they're looking for grant money. And then what we do as professors or academics or even students, all of a sudden all our decisions are based on what brings the most money or how can I get the biggest returns for what I'm doing? But the, and this goes back to the Narendra's discussion of thoughtlessness. I think there's something deeply, deeply thoughtless about this, where we just base our decisions on, you know, how do I make the biggest, you know, how do I get the biggest bang for my buck? And meanwhile, we're in the middle of, you know, what, what's being called a sixth mass extinction and the sort of terrible, you know, environmental crisis, you know, and people just, uh, and for a lot of people, it's just easy to sort of ignore that and say, you know, well, is, is it profitable or not? You know, I got a, you know, I got, I got a mortgage to pay. I get, you know, I got, you know, money, you know, I got, so anyway, we get caught up in these, what I would, you know, sort of money systems uh, where we're not thinking about stuff. And so that's, I'm actually really close to finishing. So I'm, I'm oh, looking cool. for publisher right now. I hope you'll put me on your mailing list because <laughs> I've enjoyed the work of yours that I've read so far. And it's, it's been very helpful to my own thinking. Good, thank you. And I hope we'll have further conversations in the future so thanks for having me yeah do you want to put up your book so people can see it and maybe maybe uh, let's see if, do i have them handy here's the two that i, I don't know, you might put them up there this one is called uh how neoliberalization how the neoliberalization of academia leads to thoughtlessness so this is my sort of initial this is my actually my dissertation about the ways that money is influencing academia. And then here's the other one I was referencing, which is Amor Mundi. Um, uh, it's called Amor Mundi and Overcoming Modern World Alienation. So um, those two are already out. I have, there's one about environmentalism that'll be coming out um, this next year. And then hopefully this money and thinking, one, money and thoughtlessness will come out soon, but um, I'm still shopping it around. Great. And with your permission, I'll put you on my mailing list so you can find out what we're up to in Maine. So, um, all right, well, thank you so much. And um, I'm gonna say goodbye and 
and um, fabulous work. Look forward to reading more of it. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. All right. Bye. We say main object. <laughs> Goodbye.